Thank you, Laurel. I didn't know if we were supposed to stand during that or not. I hope you've had a great week. This week between Christmas and New Year's is always a bit of a challenge. It, uh, it brings out our best and then it uh, kind of takes the legs out from under us when we so busy getting ready for uh, Christmas and then it, it's here and it seems to be gone and now we have to get ready for a new year. Quite frankly, some of us are really glad to see this year in the books. We are ready for a new start. We, uh, we have, a lot of our folks have been through uh, a tough 2013. We pray for, for good things in this coming year. I want to express thanks once again to those who've done such a beautiful job of preparing our sanctuary and other places within our church for the Christmas season. Uh, that requires a lot of effort. And uh, it has to come down, as we know, like it's your house when you have to pack it up and put it away for another year. In the process of doing so, I hope that you've had some time for reflection. I hope that as you anticipate the new year, you, you realize that uh, God is still at work. This morning, I want to ask you to open your Bibles to the book of Galatians, the letter that Paul wrote to the churches in Galatia. If you're uh, not quite familiar with uh, those letters, you'll find them after the Gospels, and then you'll see Acts and Romans and the Corinthians, and you get to the letters that Paul wrote to these churches where he either planted a church or whether he, he tried to encourage to build up the churches. The letter to the Galatians is a tremendous letter because it's a letter about freedom. It's a letter about what a life in Christ should be. And how this freedom brings us together, how it breaks down barriers, tears down walls. This morning we're going to look in the fourth chapter, and I want to read some verses beginning there in the first verse of the fourth chapter. And I'm reading from the New Living Translation. <clears throat> Think of it this way, if a father dies and leaves great wealth for his young children, those children are not much better off than slaves until they grow up even though they actually own everything their father had. They had to obey their guardians until they reached whatever age their father set. And that's the way it is with us before Christ came. We were slaves to the spiritual powers of this world. But when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. And because you Gentiles have become his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into your hearts. And now you can call God your dear father. Now you are no longer a slave, but God's own child. And since you are his child, everything he has belongs to you. Time is one of those things that for many of us seems to fly by. Perhaps for others it drags by. But time is one of those things you can't make more of. Someone had a bumper sticker that said, time is what keeps everything from happening at once. We need time. We need to understand our time. And there are, there are two words that help us to understand when we ask what time is it. There were two concepts captured in two Greek words. Paul says at just the right time God sent his son. What did he mean by that? Well, he could have meant chronos, a Greek word that has to do with when you look at your watch. One little boy got a Mickey Mouse watch for Christmas. He was so proud of it. He was just playing with it. His uncle noticed how infatuated he was with uh, this new gift he'd received. And his uncle says to his nephew, Man, that's a good-looking watch. Does it tell you the time? And the little boy says, no, you have to look at it. <laughs> what time is it? Well, we can tell time by the measurements of minutes and hours and days and so forth. And kind of get a fix as to where we are and what's going on around us. But there's another way of looking at time, and it's the Greek word for, for um, a qualitative assessment of time. You know, what is our time like? It's the time of possibility, of key moments in our lives, those opportunities to mark the events, 
the, the insight that we receive. So it's a little different approach. Which one is God speaking of? Certainly Christ came in history, as we've talked about often. We understand that there's a, a point in time when that little baby was born. We understand that that's the way life works. But there's also that sense of the era, um, what was occurring in the world. We know from the visit of the wise men that Matthew recorded that the coming of the Magi was a special event. These royal visitors who came, they had read the times. They had understood the keros. They knew that something monumental was about to happen and they wanted to be a part of it. For some of us, we, we, we live in the past. And for some of us, we have this un, almost unrealistic sense of the future. And as we consider what it means to live in a yesterday world or a tomorrow world, we, we must understand the value of living in this moment, this time. Someone perhaps a little bit uh, cliche-ish has said, when you look at time, you, you, you realize that Yesterday is history. Today is, tomorrow is a mystery. Today is now, and that's why they call it the present. It's a gift. The Bible has much to say about time. In Psalm 90, verse 12, it says, Teach us to make the most of our time so that we may grow in wisdom. And Paul, when he was writing to the Ephesians, wrote these words, So be careful how you live. Not as fools, but as those who are wise. Make the most of your time for doing good in these evil days. At just the right time, God sent his son. Well, if we look at it from the perspective of history, we realize that God is fully aware of the time. He's above time and space. He's not relegated to the things that we have to understand and be confined by. There's only a certain time that we can live. There's certain space that we can occupy. God's above all that. But yet he is fully aware of the importance of time. I'll take you through very quickly how God has responded to time. He knew what time to create the world. In Genesis 1, we're told in the beginning that there's a start. There's a, a moment when things began as God intended. He created the heavens and the earth. His intention was good. He spoke it into being, and he spoke a word of pleasure. It is good, he said. He also knew that when creating the world, when he, when he created the crown of his creation, humanity, he realized that the gift of free will would bring about some difficult time. He knew when it was time to confront sin. There is a passage in Genesis where God is coming to spend time with his creation, his creatures, his humans. And they're not there for him. They're hiding from him for they have committed disobedience. They have committed sin. And God says, where are you? It isn't that God didn't know. And he's not just simply asking about their location He's asking about the condition of their hearts. When you and I choose to live apart from him, when, when we choose our own way, as the Bible says all of us do, God is willing to confront our disobedience. But not just as judge, he also is redeemer. He knew how much we needed a relationship with him. We, he knew how much we needed um, to establish that agreement, that covenant. And so in Genesis chapter 12, he makes a promise. He makes a promise to a man named Abram. He says, I'm going to make of you a great nation. The descendants of Abraham, among which we are, we understand that God was reaching out to man to establish a way for us to live in time, to make the most of the time that we've been allowed and that is best experienced and expressed when we are in proper relationship with him. God intends for us to live fully, abundantly. Jesus said that himself in John chapter 10. I have come that you might have life, life that is full to overflowing. 
abundant life. All of us need in our time to have order and structure. There are things that we must have, boundaries that are good for us. Some of the best words you and I have ever heard are very short words. In fact, it's just of two letters. The word no. No, you won't. No, you can't. God is framing us in such a way that the life under which he made this covenant enabled us to live fully the life we've been given. He also knew that we would break the covenant. And time and time again that occurs in the annals of scripture. So he knew when he had to deliver his people. He hears the cries of those who are suffering. He hears the groaning. He looked down in Exodus chapter 2 upon the people of Israel and knew it was time to act, the scripture says. God is fully aware of the times in which we live. And as Paul wrote to the Galatians, he knew when it was time to send the one who could see to it that those who've broken the covenant still had a way out of their sin. So he sent his son. The angel announces the Savior, yes, Messiah, the Lord has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. There is a time when the Savior was needed, and that's when he came. And there will be also a time when God will look at the unfolding story of history and he will say, now it's time. You remember the discussion that the disciples had with Jesus. It's recorded for us in the first chapter of the book of Acts. The disciples want to know, well, what's next? When when is this going to be finished? When are we going to see the kingdom established? When, when, when? Have you ever had that kind of question asked of you? Around Christmas, we get a lot of those kinds of questions. The disciples wanted to know, and Jesus said, that's not any of your business. In the hands of God, time is safely kept. In our hands, oftentimes we don't do what's best with the time we've been given. We have plenty of questions. What time is it? How much time do we have? What's going to happen this coming year? Where did the time go? Can we trust God that he knows the time? He knows what we need and when we need it. I love the fact that Jesus pictured for us his father who understood his children, who knew what we needed and knew how to give what we needed to us at just the right time. In the Sermon on the Mount, he says, your father, if you have a father on the earth, your, your father knows that you don't want a, a stone when you've asked for bread. You don't want a snake when you've asked for fish. If your earthly fathers know how to give you good gifts, how much more so does your heavenly father who loves you? God knows what we need and when we need it. And so he sent his son. Do we understand the significance of that? I don't know that we ever could. You see, when we look at the major systems in the world that have to do with religion, Christianity has a number of unique qualities to it. But of the most significant, this perhaps is the most essential. While other religions call us to move toward a level of, of living, a, a proof of our goodness, our behavior, our good works. This call to move upward is not the same when it comes to our Christian faith. It isn't that we're not called to live a, a standard. In fact, Paul will underscore that in this passage. But our salvation is not found in what we can accomplish and how high we can rise. Our salvation is found in the one who came our way. Our salvation came in the form of one who took our likeness, who experienced what we experienced, who faced every temptation known to humans. God came to us. God sent his son to us. He did it for several reasons. He sent his son to set us free. I don't know that any of us could possibly understand what it means to be a slave. 
In our day and time, slavery is alive and well. If you didn't know that, you need to pay better attention. There are people in our world today who are living with chains. And we could go figurative there, but literally there are people who are living with chains, who are slaves, who have no rights, who are not respected as persons. They're simply objects, tools, a means to an end. I don't know that any of us can possibly relate to it in our own personal experience. Yet, we do understand that we weren't created to live that way. We weren't meant to be slaves. When God gave us the gift of life, he gave us this beautiful freedom of responding to him or rejecting him if we chose. But we were born in freedom. We were meant for freedom. Jesus will say, you will know the truth and the truth will set you what? Free. When the right time came, God sent his son to buy our freedom. But he didn't just want to set us free, he wanted to set us apart. He wanted us to have a status. He wanted us to know that we were chosen. Now that can lead to pride, that can lead to entitlement, or it can lead to purpose and commitment. God set us apart, not because we're special, because he felt like that there was something that he could accomplish not only in us, but through us. When that covenant was first made, it wasn't established just so that Abraham could be the big guy, that he could have great power, that he could have great influence, that he could have great wealth. No, God saw something in Abraham, and Abraham was justified by his faith, his willingness to trust. That willingness had been demonstrated when God said, I want to to take you someplace, and I'm not going to tell you where you're going. But in the process of you getting there, I'm going to do something great in you and through you, and the world will be affected by your life. God sets us apart. For a reason, for his purpose. Now, he also did something else for us. He set us up. I don't mean that in a negative way. He put us in a position we could have never earned, and we certainly don't deserve. Now you are God's own child. Something very special. I know it is in my life. It's something very special to be the son of people I respect, love. To know that I belong to him. To know that I'm his and he's mine. And I haven't done anything, anything to merit that. He picked me. He picked you. He said, I want you for my own. He set us up. The Bible says we are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. An heir. Think about that. Have you ever heard of NALPA? It's an organization, its proper title is the National Association of Unclaimed Property Administrators. In every state in the union, they've set up these funds. And in those, in that corpus are Monies that have either been neglected, abandoned, or forgotten. People don't even know they had these things, these benefits coming to them. And you can go on this website, you can click a state, and you can go down and see if your name's on the list, or your ancestor's name is on the list, and there might be a fortune in there for you. No, you can't leave yet, you have to wait. But what would happen if you went on that website, and you clicked on your state, and you found your family, and you realized that all of a sudden you had money that you never knew was there. How would that change you? You know, recently um, we had a woman here in Buckhead who had one of the winning tickets for the Mega Millions. I think she 
her, her take in it was something in the order of 330 something million, is that correct? $330 million. Do you think she got up and went to work the next day? Or told her boss what she really thought of him or her? Do you think she lives the same now that she knows that she had? I don't know how much of that 330 she's actually going to take. Probably not as much as she might like. In the state of Florida, they've done studies. I imagine they've done them in other places. They've done studies about people who've won lotteries. They sort of traced what happened after to see. And there's so many sad stories, some of them even tragic stories, about what people do when all of a sudden they have something that they didn't have before. We think maybe if we had just enough money, we could make everything work. Well, we'd all like to try, wouldn't we? But what if somebody dumped a bunch of money on you tomorrow? I do have a few suggestions if that happens to you. We, we have some needs around here. Um, but what would happen? What would happen to you? You see, Paul's talking about this. He's talking about those who had nothing and now are given everything. You were slaves and now you're free. In the Roman Empire, during the days this was written, there were more slaves than there were free people. What would happen to us if our former condition had been wiped from the books and we walked away free? Not only free, but as joint heirs with Christ. What would it mean to be a joint heir with Jesus? Well, from what I can read in the scripture, it says that he's the creator of all things. He holds all things together. He rules and reigns over all things. Jesus is indeed Lord. And we, we're joint heirs with the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Alpha, the Omega, the Lion of Judah. Wouldn't that... Wouldn't that put an extra bounce in your step? Wouldn't that make you straighten your shoulders and walk with your chin lifted a little higher? Wouldn't that make some difference in your life if you knew you were a joint heir with the king? Paul says to these Galatians, now that you're free, I want you to live like it. Free from what? Free from the power of sin in our lives. The entanglements that trip us up. The things that rob us of our joy. That sense that we're afraid and uncertain about what might happen. We wring our hands in worry and anxiety. And that's not how we're supposed to live. I am convinced that he who began a good work in you will complete it in the day of Jesus Christ. And my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. On and on and on. Scripture lifts our spirits and encourages us to live as the free adopted children of the king. He chose you. He wants you at his table with his family. You're not a slave. You're not some second class citizen. You are his prized possession. You are his children. It's not easy because we still are captured by our time and how we use it. Mom had promised to take her daughter to the park. She really had a busy schedule and she had to fit it in, but she had promised. And her little girl was fascinated because it was the time of year 
and the dandelions were springing up everywhere. And you know what you do with a dandelion. You don't just walk past a dandelion, you pick it up. And then what do you do with it? You don't get out much, do you? (laughs) You blow it. And she stopped at every one of them and picked up every one of them and blew. Her mom kept looking at her watch impatiently until finally she sort of exploded a bit. She said, honey, we don't have time for this. Her daughter looked up at her and said, mom, well, what is time for? You know, I wish I could guarantee you that this next year would be full of joy and accomplishment, that there'd be a deep sense of peace in your life because everything went well. I can't promise you that. I can't even promise you that you're going to get out at 12 noon today. There's nothing about the future that I can say is going to happen. And we could probably agree that 2014 will have its ups and its downs. There are things that will happen in these next weeks and months, this next year, that will bring you great joy and perhaps great sadness. That's what happens in time. But you and I get to choose how we're going to live each day that we're given because we don't have the promise of another one. You and I can choose to live as God sees us, as God has made us, like children of the King, join heirs with Jesus Christ. It takes a change. A few years ago, Showtime put together a documentary. It was about a homeless man named Ted Rodrigue. I don't know how they uh, chose to do this. I'm not even sure of the ethical consequences of it, but they did it because they thought it would make a good show. They found this guy and they followed him for a while and they figured out the patterns. And he would go to a certain dumpster and he'd pull out aluminum cans to sell so he'd have something to eat. So they decided that they were going to manipulate this guy's life and they they, uh, they packed $100,000 into a suitcase, a briefcase, stuck it in the dumpster to see what would happen. He found the briefcase. They filmed it. He looked around. He was startled by his good fortune, but he didn't want anybody else to know. And he certainly wasn't about to, certainly wasn't about to turn in the briefcase. So they followed him. And they watched. The first thing he did was he bought some food. He didn't scrounge out of a dumpster. He went in and bought food. Then he got an apartment. He bought a bike. He found a girlfriend. Then he went down to the car dealership and he bought a $35,000 truck. A few days later, he bought another truck for another homeless buddy of his. By now, there were some family and friends in the mix, and they were trying to help him, and they were trying to counsel him, and trying to encourage him not to throw all this money away, but he refused any of their help. And he didn't get a job. He didn't need a job because, in his mind, Ted Rodriguez was set for life. At the end of the documentary... Ted Rodriguez was homeless again, and the $100,000 was long gone. Our stories don't have to end that way. It isn't about money. Although any of us who found, stumbled upon $100,000 would have plenty of ideas of what you could do with it. But ultimately who you are, who I am, the way we choose to live is based on something that something then something that will come and go. What is it that lasts for you? What is the foundation of the life you're trying to build? 
Will that foundation stay strong when 2014 hits us? We can all be certain that there will be uncertainties. But there is something that we can have, something that we sang about a few moments ago. One of those words was the word peace. Peace that the God who has chosen us, the God who has sent his son to us, the God who has redeemed us, the God who will finish history his way, that God, we decide, is he worthy of our trust? And is that trust going to demonstrate itself day to day in the way in which we lean on him instead of our own wisdom and understanding? You know, ultimately, it's a personal choice. Nobody can make that choice for you. How will you make the most of this precious gift of time that God has entrusted to you? I wish for you the happiest of New Year's. But I want something more than happiness for you. I want the joy that comes from those who know they belong to him. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, time is truly a gift. Life is truly a gift. We only get one of them. And we can't make more time. We only have what's given to us. And Lord, we know that. We understand how it works. But Father, we pray. We pray that somehow the covenant that you wish to establish with us, sealed in the blood of your Son, would become more real to us in the living of these days. That in our understanding and experience of your love, we would return the gift to you, a life well lived, time well spent. Help us to invest what's been entrusted to us. That not only our lives might be richer, but those around us would be. That you could see in us those who are dedicated to making the most of the moments and the relationships that you've allowed us to have. How thankful I am to be a part of this people, to understand that you have called us together for this time. And that we have great things to accomplish because we have great things to expect from you. Lord, thank you. Help us. Give us peace, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. We sing a song as we come to the close of our service today. It's a song that reflects the season. It's a song that speaks of this wondrous gift. Thou didst leave thy throne. At just the right time, Jesus came to be here with us, to show us his Father and to give us the hope of being able to spend eternity with him. If today you're not certain that you will step into eternity when your time is done, I can offer you some assurance, and I'd love to talk with you about how you can become personally related to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I believe that's the most important decision any human ever makes. Maybe today you're looking for a home, and I would recommend that why you could to you. This is a place where you'll be loved, and where you'll be expected to use your life, your time, to honor God. Come and join the family. We'd love for you to do that. We'll stand together and we'll sing. Come if you will. I'll be waiting right here at the front. Let's stand together and sing our hymn, number 121, Thou that Leave Thy Throne.